Um, so um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Professor Paul Starkey, um, Emeritus Professor of Arabic Literature at Durham University and the Chair of the uh, Banapal Trust for Arab Literature. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this uh, event, and it's good to see the hall so splendidly full. Um, as chair of the Bani Pal Trust for Arab Literature, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the second Saif Gubash Bani Pal Prize lecture, made possible by a generous donation from Umar Saif Gubash and his family, who also sponsor uh, the Saif Gubash Bani Pal Prize for Arabic Literary Translation, which has been running uh, for many years, uh, whereas the lecture is a comparatively new venture. Our speaker tonight is Robert Irwin, who will already be well known to many of you as a writer both of fiction and non-fiction, a Middle Eastern scholar, a historian, and the scourge, or one of the scourges of Edward Said and Orientalism. Among his best-known books, some of which are on display uh, in outside this room, are The Arabian Nights, A Companion, for Lust of Knowing, The Orientalists and Their Enemies. Uh, several novels, as his seventh novel, Wonders Will Never Cease, was published last year in 2016. And for 2018, uh, we are promised a reconsideration of Ibn Khaldun, uh, which is set to overturn, I gather, conventional views. Robert's topic tonight, however, is a rather different one. He is to speak to us on the subject of Tayyib Saleh's season of migration to the north, the most important novel, it has been said, of the 20th century. Tayyib Saleh himself will also, of course, need little or no introduction to many of you although sadly he himself is no longer with us, having died in 2009, his books live on, in particular perhaps The Wedding of Sain and his masterpiece, which is the focus of tonight's lecture, Season of Migration to the North, Mausim al-Hijra al-Shimal, first published in Arabic in 1966 uh, and in English translation in 1969. For the English-speaking reader, Season of Migration to the North, as it is known in its English translation, will also be forever linked, I think, with the name of Dennis Johnson Davis, the greatest of uh, modern Arabic-English literary translators of modern Arabic literature, who himself sadly passed away earlier this year at the ripe old age of 94. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Robert. I'm conscious of the honour of speaking at this annual lecture, which, is, as you heard, has only recently been established. The previous talk was given by the famous novelist and academic Anton Shamas. Um, although the lecture series was only established last year, the translation prize was first endowed in 2006. Had the prize been around in 1969, I have no doubt whatsoever that it would have gone to Dennis Johnson Davies for his incandescent translation of Taib Salih's novel, which had been first, as you've heard, published in Arabic in 1966. Now, I'm guessing that perhaps most of my audience has read this novel, and that is why they're here. But I also guess that a substantial minority are unfamiliar with the author and have not read the book, and that is why they're here, to find out if he and it are any good. So a preliminary mini-biography and a synopsis seem necessary. Those of you who already know the story will have to suffer just a few minutes of boredom. But first, the man. 
Taib Saleh was born in the village, village of Karamakol in northern Sudan in 1929. I've been able, there's Taib Saleh. Um, and I've been unable to find an image of Karamakol. There's very little I can find on the internet about it. But this is the kind of village, northern Sudanese village, that he would have grown up in. Um, he studied in Khartoum and at the University of London. He spent many years in London, where he worked first for an Arabic newspaper, and later for the BBC's Arabic service, and later yet for UNESCO in Paris. The novels Doom Tree of Wad Hamid and The Wedding of Zain were published in Arabic in 1960 and 1964, respectively. Both deal with Sudanese village life. Then came season of migration to the north, after that, in 1971 and 1976, the two-part novel Banda Shah was published. The setting was once again a northern Sudanese village, though mystical and allegorical themes were to, were to the fore. In 1980, Cypriot Man, perhaps the most notable of his short stories, was published in Encounter. And as you've heard, he died in 2009. Now for the synopsis. Sometime in the 1960s, the unnamed narrator returns to his Sudanese village on the bank of the Nile after years in England studying an obscure English poet. Soon after his return, he meets Mustafa Said, a man from elsewhere in the Sudan who's chosen to settle in this village. Eventually, in the course of a drinking bout, Mustafa, by suddenly reciting an obscure English poem, inadvertently reveals that he too has received a thoroughgoing British education. The narrator slowly pieces together the story of Mustafa's education in Khartoum, Cairo, and London, his successive seduction of three English women who ended their lives by committing suicide, and his sadomasochistic affair with a fourth woman, Jean Morris, whom he murdered, and for which he spent time in an English jail. Then Mustafa, though he'd been described as an excellent swimmer, drowned in the river. Suicide for sure. The narrator has been given charge of his widow, Hosna, and her two children, as well as a key to a locked room in Mustafa's house. The contents of the locked room will reveal more of Mustafa's story. But the narrator, who's often in the way in Khartoum, is unable to prevent Hosna being forced into a marriage with an aged and lust lustful villager called Wad Rais. On the wedding night, she murders him before committing suicide. He needs rescuing, and so did his country. Set in the 1960s, season of migration reflects the uncertainties that arose in the years after Sudan's achievement of independence in 1956, the ensuing civil war and establishment of military government, and so on. It gives voice to the suspicions of the inhabitants of rural Sudan regarding the decisions taken in Khartoum. Mustafa Said's seduction and ruin of four English women is presented by him as an act of post-colonial vengeance, and above all, the novel deals with the poisonous and yet ambiguous legacy of colonialism. We are a doomed people, so regale us with amusing stories. But how can we find pleasure in a tale of political bitterness with multiple rapes and murders? It was, gentlemen, after a long absence, seven years to be exact, during which time I was studying in Europe, that I returned to my people. I learnt much and much passed me by, but that's another story. The important thing is that I returned with great yearning for my people in that small village in the bend of the Nile. In the opening lines of the novel, the narrator starts to tell his story to a male audience. The fiction, that it is an or fiction is that it's an orally delivered narrative. In this, it mirrors the Thousand and One Nights, or the Arabian Nights, whose stories were allegedly told by Sherazad to King Shariar, and within some of the stories told by Sherazad, other stories have been boxed or nested. And boxed within the story told by the narrative Taib Salis novel, we find the story of Mustafa Said, and among other things, the stories he tells to seduce white women. The stories Mustafa Said tells in order to seduce Isabella Seymour unmistakably echo those told by Othello in his wooing of Desdemona, cannibals which do each other eat, the anthropophagi and men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders, as Othello has it. The novel is dense with intertextual references to Othello, The Tempest, Richard III, Freud's writings, and Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness, but also to the Quran, pre-Islamic poetry, Abu Nuwas, and the Arabian Nights. 
An intertext is, in literary theory, a text evaluated in terms of its explicit relation, for example, by allusion, to other texts, and intertextuality derives from that word. To stick with the Arabian Nights for the time being, when Season of Migration appeared in its English translation, a reviewer in The Observer described it accurately enough as an Arabian Nights in reverse. In Salih's book, it's Europe that is the land of exotic marvels, a land where fish die of cold, and also a land of biddable women. women. Or is that only a fantasy of Mustafa's? The core of the Arabian Nights, the story of Sharia, Shah Zaman, and Shirazad, and the opening series of stories told by Shirazad, consist of stories about despotism, sexual betrayal, travels to strange lands, magic, the workings of fate, and storytelling to save one's life. Those same themes give Salih's novel much of its depth and richness, and they serve to underline its preoccupations. In London, uh, Mustafa decorated his room in the style of the Arabian Nights. By contrast, the locked room later encountered in the Sudanese village has only books in English in it, and there's nothing out of there. The Encyclopedia Britannica, Gibbon, Macaulay, Toynbee. The London part of the story, in part that of a black man who sleeps with white women, can be seen as echoing the earliest scene in the Arabian Nights, in which Shah Zaman returns unexpectedly early from hun hunting. When he entered his room, it was to discover his wife with a black slave. The world turned dark for him. The first three English women that Mustafa Said has affairs with all perish after they've heard his stories of Africa and have slept with him, rather as King Sharia's virgins perished after being brought to his bed. They commit suicide. But in an inver inversion of the Arabian Nights, none of them are storytellers, while Mustafa is. For example, he entertains Isabella Seymour with stories that are lies. I related to her fabricated stories about deserts of golden sands and jungles where non-existent animals called out to one another. I told her that the streets of my country teemed with elephants and lions and that during siesta time, crocodiles crawled through it. The fourth woman, Jean Morris, is different, though her end will be equally grim. As Mustafa pursues her, he compares himself to a slave Sharia you buy in a market for a dinar. Jean's capacity for lying and her ability to concoct the most fantastic stories about what she's been doing lead Mustafa to compare her to a mendicant Shirazad. The forbidden ch chamber or forbidden door is a familiar motif in stories of the Arabian Nights. It features in the story of the third calendar, in that of Jan Shah, the man who never laughs, and Hassan of Basra. Western parallels include Bluebeard's chamber and Dorian Gray's attic. That's the portrait of Dorian Gray <coughs> as it was painted for the film in 1945. It currently hangs in the Chicago Art Institute. I'll probably come back to Dorian Gray. In Saleh's novel, the nar narrator's friend Mahjoub drunkenly speculates about the locked room. And he suggests that Mustafa Said is in fact the prophet Khidr suddenly making his appearance and uh, suddenly vanishing. The treasures that lie in this room are like those of King Solomon, brought here by genies. And you have the key to that treasure. Open sesame and let's distribute the gold and jewels to the people. In fact, the locked chamber, the key of which is entrusted by Mustafa before his death to the narrator, once penetrated, hints at the secret of their twin destinies. Perhaps it would have been better not to have entered that room, for the plague that is Western culture has been concealed in that secret place in a little village beside the Nile. The novel Banda Shah is similarly in an intertextual relationship with the Knights, though magic features more prominently in its narrative than in a uh, season of migration. But magic, or the illusion of magic, is not wholly absent from the earlier novel. Early on in the novel, Mustafa, drunk at a village drinking season, starts reciting English poetry from the First World War. This has a powerful effect on the narrator. I tell you, had the ground suddenly split open and revealed an Ifrit standing before me, his eyes shooting out flames, I would not have been more terrified. All of a sudden there came to me the ghastly, nightmarish feeling that we, the men grouped together in that room, were not a reality, but merely some illusion. Taib Saleh, uh, when I went to visit him, to interview him, uh, and in an interview which I, or I should say rather we, since Joe Glanville is also in the audience, we conducted with him quite some years ago, 
uh, we asked him about his enthusiasm for the nights, and he reflected on traditional storytelling that he grew up listening to. Could we have a sound, please? The Sudanese writer Taib Saleh, who publishes novels in Arabic, remembers storytellers coming to his village when he was a child. Storytellers and chanters, mainly they chant praises of the Prophet and they tell the whole history of Islam in a mythological sense. These are important people. They may be living in the village, but they belong to a wider audience and they travel from one village to another and they represent a very nice aspect of life. It does dispel the boredom, you know, of the dark nights in these villages. There's more to be said about parallels between the Arabian Nights and seasonal migration. But now, what is intertextuality for? According to Gordon Allen's textbook entitled Intertextuality, whether it be based in post-structuralist or Bakhtinian theories or in both, intertextuality reminds us that all texts are potentially plural, reversibly open to readers' own presuppositions, lacking in clear and defined boundaries and always involved in the expression or repression of the dialogic voices which exist within society. At first sight, this is academic verbiage and not <laughs> terribly helpful, <laughs> but we shall see. Meanwhile, I will introduce a brief autobiographical reflection. When some months ago I asked myself what was the purpose of seasonal migration's intertextual references, I fell to reflecting on my own recent novel, Wonders Will Never Cease. That novel is set in 15th century England, and not only does it quote, plagiarize, and pastiche such sources as Mallory, Dante, Villon, Julian of Norwich, and the Arabian Nights, but it also quotes, plagiarizes, and pastiches Sir Thomas Brown, Joseph de Maist, H.G. Wells, Claude Levi Strauss, and others. Why had I done that, I asked myself. The only answer I could come up with was that it was such fun. It was like shoplifting, but without the legal penalties. <laughs> Intertextuality can be a ludic pleasure. Lawrence Stern, Denis Diderot, Jan Potosky, Vladimir Nabokov, Georges Perec, Italo Calvino, Georges Louis Borges, John Updike, and David Lodge can be reckoned among those who have produced novels that play games with intertextuality, anagrams, self-reference, mathematically determined patterns, and whatnot. So Taib Saleh is in good company among the games-playing novelists. Though, of course, these sort of literary games are quite strange ones, since the novelist cannot know the identity of those whom he is playing with or against. Taib Saleh liked lit literary play, as he told Mohammed Shaheen in an interview published in Banipal in 2001. I think one takes deep pleasure in being able to play with language. I found some pleasure in playing with language. So, <clears throat> I think that there may be a ludic element in the intertextuality of season of migration. Taib Saleh was enjoying himself. But that can only be part of the answer. References to the Quran, Abu Nuwas, Conrad and Freud give the novel a kind of density. The range of reference suggests both the convergence of two cultures, Eastern and Western, and their clashing. Moreover, references to pre-Islamic poetry in Othello suggests that the attitudes and problems that Taiz Saleh was addressing were not newly created and arbitrary, but are centuries old. More specifically, covert or open references to the fates of Othello, Desdemona, and Mr. Kurtz, as well as to Freud on Fanatos, provides the plotting of seasonal migration with a strong sense of inevitability, of fatality. These paths have been trodden before and their end is not good. It also seems to me that intertextuality is not like a river that flows in one direction. Yes, the references to earlier literary sources help to give depth and clarity in the story of seasonal migration, but Taib Salis' novel is not merely the passive beneficiary of items from earlier literary cultures, since I believe that reading that novel should actively impel the reader to turn back to the Arabian Nights, Othello, The Heart of Darkness, and Civilization and Its Discontents, and read those texts in a new light. It really is a dialogue among literatures. 
the Don Quixote produced by Georges Louis Borges's Pierre Menard in the 20th century was word for word identical with that produced by Cervantes in the 16th century, but yet the meaning of Menard's novel was quite different since it reflected 20th century preoccupations. Similarly, if we follow David Lodge's Pierce McGarrigal in the novel Small World, we cannot now read Shakespeare's plays without reckoning on the influence of T.S. Eliot on those plays. Again, dialogue. But now, the Arabian Nights is not the main text whose ghostly presence helps give seasonal migration so much of its density and sense of menace. That surely is Conrad's Heart of Darkness, published in 1902. Salih's novel, with its relaxed opening, it was gentleman after a long absence, seven years to be exact, during which time I was studying in Europe and so on, um, surely echoes the equally leisurely beginning of Marlowe's yarn to his audience of gentlemen on a yawl on the Thames. The Nile and the Thames and the Congo, snaking paths that lead a narrator in a dark quest to identify to discover the true identity of a certain man of great promise and accomplishment, a man calling Mr. Kurtz or Mustafa Said, who is not what he seems. And that narrative about the encounter of two individuals in the heart of Africa and the consequent unwelcome revelations is at the same time a dark parallel about the evils of colonialism. Other scholars have drawn attention to the numerous parallels between the two novels, and there's no need for me to pursue the obvious here. Instead, I want to take that as, that as given and investigate the problem of the narrator. In Conrad's novel, and I think in Salih's novel, the man who's relating the novel is all but invisible to us. In the Heart of Darkness, what is the name of the man who narrates its story? We don't know. It's not Marlowe, who is the protagonist of the story, and who's traveled to the dark heart of Africa and whose discourse occupies almost the entire text. It is rather an anonymous, featureless dog's body, an underling presumably of the director of companies, who sits with other underlings on the yawn, yawl in the Thames, and it's he who describes the setting on the Thames, and then listens to Marlowe's yarn and transmits it to us. Marlowe's narrative has been embedded by Conrad. Then, what is the name of the man who tells the story of a season of migration to the north? Taib Saleh told, chose not to give it to us. When the novel opens, the narrator is talking to gentlemen who are similarly unnamed. There's a distancing effect here. Saleh's narrator, the man who reports the story that Mustafa Sai told him, and who indirectly, at least, was responsible for a bloody murder and suicide, that of Wad Rais and Husna, is anonymous. And yet, on the basis of external clues, he's clearly the same as Mohammed as he features in Banda Shah and Cypriot Man. Why is it then that he doesn't speak his name in Season of Migration to the North? Why does nobody at any point call him by his name? It is, I think, because in this novel, Saleh did not wish Mohammed to have a fully fleshed independent identity. Yes, he is an independent, as it were, freestanding character with his own education and career, unlike the silent list on the yawl in the Thames, and yet there are current hints that he is none other than Mustafa Said, the man he purports to have been listening to. Or if not Mustafa Said, then alternatively, Mustafa Said is his doppelganger. Mustafa Said's story is framed by that of the narrator, Mohammed, as I shall refer to him from now on, narrator's tiresome. And Mohammed, like Mustafa, has achieved remarkable success as a student and gone on to work in England before returning to his native village beside the Nile. The destinies of the two are closely internet, internet perhaps somewhat in the manner of Sinbad of the Sea and Sinbad of the Land. You may recall that in the Arabian Nights, Sinbad of the Land was summoned into existence to be the audience for the stories of Sinbad of the Sea. It's even possible that the narrator and Mustafa are one and the same person, Mustafa being none other than the incarnation of Mohammed's fantasies about what he might have done in England, indeed a kind of afrit. When the narrator finally dares enter the locked room, he encounters in its darkness what seems to be his adversary, Mustafa Said. The face grew a neck, the neck, two shoulders, and a chest, then a trunk, and two legs, and I found myself staring face to face with myself. This is not Mustafa Said, it's a picture of me, frowning at my face from a mirror. 
At several points in the novel, Mustafa Said insists he's not a real person. In the courtroom in London on trial for murder, he finds himself thinking that Mustafa Said does not exist. He's an illusion, a lie. I ask of you, he says, addresses the jury, to rule that the lie be killed. And again, I am no Othello, I am a lie. The narrator himself has doubts about his interlocutor. Occasionally the disturbing thought occurs to me that Mustafa Said never happened, that he was in fact a lie, a phantom, a dream or a nightmare that had come to the people of the village one suffocatingly dark night and when they opened their eyes to the sunlight he was nowhere to be seen. If Mustafa Said was never really alive then he can never really die. In Khartoum too the phantom of Mustafa Said appeared to me less than a month after my conversation with the retired Mamour, like a genie who's been released from his prison and will continue thereafter to whisper in men's ears. Whispering from the Quran, one would know his very sinister uh, resonances it's to do with witchcraft. Of course, in one particular sense, Mustafa Said is a lie and a phantom. Taib Saleh made him up. It's also possible that Taib Saleh residing and working in London, was allowing himself to fantasize about how it would be were he to return to the village of his birth and settle there. And in so doing, he created not one, but two fantastic alternatives, most of his side and Mohammed. But that's speculation and I shan't pursue it. The sinister image of the double has a history in Gothic and Romantic literature. Think of James Hogg, E.T.A. Hoffman, Edgar Allan Poe, a uh, student of Prague, made in 1913. Um, um, in this story, the unhappy student kills his double and in so doing, kills himself. The Bulgarian literary theorist Svetan Todorov took Freud's theorizing further and in his brilliant book, The Fantastic, argued that what is essential to the unheimlich or uncanny is a hesitation between the supernatural explanation and a natural one. The classic example is Henry James's novella, The Turn of the Screw, where we are unable to determine whether the children are genuinely the victims of malevolent haunting, or whether we're reading an unwittingly revealing account of the fantasies of their sexually frustrated governors. The duality, the dark reflection of Mohammed in Mustafa Said may possibly reflect a similar du duality that may be present in Conrad's Heart of Darkness. In Heart of Darkness, Marlowe describes his quest in these terms. I was anxious to deal with this shadow by myself alone. Kurtz is what is known in the literary trade as an adversary self. And Carl Miller in Doubles, a study in literary history, has argued that Marlowe and Kurtz in some sense share a common identity and that this reflects Conrad's obsessive preoccupation with the duality in man's nation, nature. I'm not sure how persuasive Margaret's, uh, Miller's argument is, but still. Um, anyway, Marlowe travels into the heart of Africa to have a conversation with the famously cultured and articulate Mr. Kurtz, but he never will have that conversation. All he will hear are the whispered words, the horror, the horror. Ah, this is Martin Sheen. Um, what's he doing here? Uh, uh, yes, um, the notion of Mr. Kurtz as the double of the man who's traveling upriver to seek him out was taken up with some enthusiasm by Francis Ford Coppola and his scriptwriter John Milius in that marvelous film about neo-imperialism, Apocalypse Now. Uh, came out in 1979, so they were ahead of um, Carl Miller and his book on doubles. Um, though the film's debt to Conrad is perfectly explicit, there are important differences. Marlowe was sent by the company to rescue Kurtz. Willard was sent by the US Army up the Vietnam's Nung River to murder Kurtz. But when Willard succeeds in this, he then replaces him as the rogue leader of an anti-Viet Cong guerrilla army. This ending explicitly draws on another source. In The Golden Bow, published in 1890, the Victorian anthropologist Sir James Fraser wrote about the Grove of Nemi in Italy as it featured in Virgil's Aeneid. In this sacred grove there grew a certain tree round which at any time of day and probably far into night a grim figure might be seen to prowl. In his hand he carried a drawn sword and he kept peering wearily about him as if at every instant he expected to be set upon by an enemy. He was a priest and a murderer and the man for whom he looked for was sooner or later to murder him and hold the priesthood in his stead. Such was the rule of the sanctuary. 
We picture to ourselves the scene as it may have been witnessed by a belated wayfarer on one of those wild autumn nights when the dead leaves are falling thick and the winds seem to sing the dirge of a dying year. It's a somber picture set to melancholy music, the background of the forest showing black and jagged against a lowering and stormy sky, the sighing of the wind in the branches, the rustle of the withered leaves underfoot, the lapping of the cold water on the shore, and in the foreground pacing to and fro, now in twilight, now in gloom, a dark figure with a glitter of steel at the shoulder whenever the pale moon, riding clear of the cloud rack, peers down at him through matted boughs. Yeah, that was a digression, though the prose is so fine, it was irresistible. They don't write anthropological texts like that anymore. <laughs> Duality pervades season of migration. It's present within Mustafa Said, whose split mind is caught between Sudanese and British culture, between rural and urban values, be tri between triumph and self-loathing, between the sex wish and the death wish. Yet there is also an external expression of duality, since, as has been noted, there are repeated hints that Mustafa Said is Mohammed's phantom, doppelganger, and even at the risk of considerable bathos, his imaginary friend. Mohammed has no sex with English women, and he is very reticent about sex altogether. So perhaps it has fallen to Mustafa Said to live out the richly tormented sexual life that Mohammed can only fantasize about. With all this in mind, let's look at the ending. When I first read this novel back in the 60s, I assumed that Mohammed in the river, having cried for help, was nevertheless doomed to follow Mustafa Said, and so he'd ended up drowned and dead. Well, that was a very careless misreading, for obviously he must survive the river in order to tell his story to those anonymous gentlemen. He is then perhaps what Svetan Todorov, him again, would call a narrative man. Um, Mohammed's character is subservient to his narrative and he's saved by his story, as so many characters in the Arabian Nights are saved by the stories they tell, starting with Sherazade herself and going on to include, among others, the fisherman and the genie out of the flask, the merchant who killed the genie's son, and the seven characters accused of killing the hunchback. Mohammed's cry for help may be panicky, and he does need help, but it's not one of utter despair. He has decided not to die. So the end is what? Illusion, wham, pervades Taib Saleh's story. When Mohammed entered the waters of the Nile, determined to put an end to his life, he states that there was no point in lighting another fire and that I left him talking and went out. I did not let him complete the story. Who's not completed the story? It has to be Mustafa Said, who in the immediately preceding pages has been telling the story of his abject love for Jean. Perhaps that should be Jin or Jinia. Jin is not a coincidental name, I think. And their disastrous marriage. So logically, Mustafa should be alive when Mohammed decides to imitate him and go to a watery grave. Or perhaps rather, as I've been suggesting above, Mustafa was never really alive. He was a phantom of Mohammed's brain. So many illusions. Illusion dominates the relations between North and South. The benefits of liberation are proving to be an illusion. Mustafa's notion that he can liberate Africa with his penis is an illusion. The notion that one can ever know the truth about what was experienced by Mustafa Said Mohammed, who is his interlocutor, obituarist, and perhaps something else much stranger, is also an illusion. One never gets the true final story. To go back to the beginning, it was, gentlemen, after a long absence. Who are these gentlemen? Yes, Aditi. Mohammed's audience in the opening of the sentence, of the no opening sentence of the novel. This is a term of respect, customarily, customarily addressed to superiors. It's very unlikely to have been used by Mohammed addressing his fellow villagers, and they would know half the story anyway. Well, one faint possibility is that the, the root of the noun sad is um, seen ein dal. It's the same as the second part of Mustafa Said's name, happy or auspicious. So it's perhaps a hint that Mohammed is addressing Mustafa Said's in his future readership. I wouldn't place much weight on that. Um, it seems rather unlikely. I prefer an e equally unlikely possibility that Mohammed is reaching across time to address Marlowe's audience on the yawl in the Thames, Kirka 19.2. It's a possibility. 
So this novel about colonialism, post-colonialism, eroticism, and the death wish is also at a profound level a story about storytelling. We are a doomed people, so regale us with amusing stories. To my ear, the first part of this sentence has Quranic resonances. One thinks of the Quran's references to the doomed races of Ard, Thamud, and the people of Pharaoh, whereas the second part of the sentence, regale us with amusing stories, sounds more like something out of an opening ploy from the Arabian Nights. But actually, the first part also can be seen as echoing the Arabian Nights, since the exordium of the earliest manuscript known to us of the Arabian Nights, translated by Galland, begins, praise be to God, the beneficent king, creator of the world, and so on, and goes on, uh, who spread out the earth as a place of rest and wrecked mountains, mountains of props and made the water flow from the hard rock and destroyed the race of Thamud, Ard, and Pharaoh, the vast domain. And later on, the Arabian Nights, Shirazad will indeed tell the story of the ill-fated Ard ibn Shaddad and the lost city of Iram of the Columns. To very briefly pick up on something else, which I don't think I've really got time to follow up, Mohammed's village is situated on a bend in the river. This anodyne topographical description may lead one to think of Veer Snipel's novel, A Bend in the River, which was published in 1972. So some years after Taib Saleh was translated into English, it's very possible, I think it's more likely than not, that Naipaul's novel is intertextual with Season of Migration. It certainly is explicitly intertextual with Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Um, and beginning to edge towards the end, this is the question of the title of this novel, Season of Migration to the North, Mausum al-Hijra ila Shamal. I ask myself, uh, why isn't it Mausima Rihla ila Shema? Why isn't it the season of the journey to the north? Rihla is a well established genre in Arabic literature, examples by Ibn Battuta, Ibn Jubair, Ibn Fadlan, and quite a lot of more recent narratives about journeys to Europe, of which Tahtawis was one of the earliest and most distinguished. So, why is it Hijra? My first thought was this might be, have a religious resonance, that it might be to do with the hijrah of Muhammad from Mecca to Medina and later uses of it to refer to Muslims who leave infidel territory to go to Muslim territories. That's a hijrah. But I think, no, it, it rather refers to, it's the sense of uh, migration, sense that animals and birds migrate. And that's confirmed in the last or penultimate page of Season of Migration, where Muhammad is halfway in the river, halfway between the north and the south, very emblematic that, and he's struggling to stay afloat, and he looks up and he sees formations of sand grouse flying north, and he asks himself, is it winter or is it summer? Hal here rihla am hijra. So it's that sense, but there's something more too. I went to the Oxford Arabic English Dictionary to get the precise resonances of hajra, which is the triconsonantal verb from which the noun hijra is formed. And it, hajra means to leave behind, to abandon, to give up, to renounce. And that seems exactly right. That's a very precise registration of what the novel really is about. It's not about really about coming to London and what one finds there. It's about the abandonment of the Sudanese village. It's what's left, what's, what these people have had to give up in order to get this Western education. Moving towards the end now. Reading and rereading Taib Salih's remarkable book, at times one has the sense of gazing into an abyss, at other times of wandering in a hall of mirrors or leafing through a crestomathy of literary references. The literary theorist Julia Kristeva argued that works of literature are not conceived in some kind of isolation ward, but rather they relate to other earlier works of literature. A new work of literature has to fit in with a pre-existing mosaic of images and stories. Similarly, the cultural critic Roland Barthes wrote, every text is an intertext. Other texts are present within it to varying degrees and in more or less recognizable forms. So, 
Coming back to Gordon Allen's summary of the sense of intertextuality, whether it be based in post-structuralist or Bakhtinian theories, or in both, intertextuality reminds us that all texts are potentially plural, reversibly open to the reader's own presuppositions, lacking in clear and defined boundaries, and always involved in the expression or repression of dialogic voices which exist within society. Perhaps this makes a bit more sense now. I think it makes perfect sense to me. Uh, you don't look well. Um, of course, this is intended to apply to all, all literature. It will apply to Middlemarch, and it will apply also to what Ho Jeeves. Um, but it does seem peculiarly obvious to apply to a season of migration. Um, and yet, and yet it is, of course, quite possible to read and enjoy a season of migration to the north without worrying about Kristeva, Bart, and Todorov. As a young man, I managed this feat. <laughs> the 60s, the Kennedy years, the Beatles, smoking pot. Though season of migration is a 60s novel, there's none of that there, for it is a novel set in the retrospective mode. Setting games and theories aside, one of the things that this novel does is evoke worlds that are now mostly lost to us. There is the London of the 1920s, recovering from the traumas of World War I, and the city's pubs, theatres, football matches, and earnest readings of Keynes and Shaw, and England, the land of hanky-panky, the semi-fabulous place where fishes die of cold. And there is the Sudanese village, on a bend in the Nile with its traditional ways, on both banks are thick plantations of date palms with water wheels turning and from time to time a water pump. The men are bare chested, wearing long under trousers. They cut or sew. When a steamer passes by, like a castle floating in the middle of the Nile, they stand up straight and turn to it for a while and then go back to what they were doing. But Mohammed's village and the English city are equally arenas of fierce and lethal passions. The village with its donkeys and turtle doves, its folkloric and Islamic values, is no unchanging pastoral idyll, no land of lost content. The atmosphere and imagery of the Arabian Nights may pervade season of migration, but in the end, the world of the nights will have to be set aside as something that belongs to the past. What we have is a dark fairy story whose recurrent imagery, the knife in the skull, the bow and arrow of destiny, the river Nile twisting like a snake god as it runs north, the flocks of birds also migrating north, and the chilly-minded Mustafa side drawn whether he will or not towards the cold of the north. These images and Salih's incantatory prose sweep the reader along, not to a happy ending, but to a triumphant one. Thank you. Lovely, uh, delightful, quiet, charming person Time was. And uh, he, he, in his quiet way, it was amazing that this novel uh, was emerging for, uh, from him. Uh, but he said, essentially, it was that he was happy writing about the Sudanese. Wedding of Zayn, Dum Tree of Wad Hamid, all those, uh, all those stories, he actually that felt at home at. He said, you know, we, Dennis and I said to him, look, you know, here you are, you've live, live, been living in London for, for years, your English is absolutely fluent, you know, you could do the English uh, translation of this book. No, I am happy with the, with the, the bend in the river, interesting re reference, uh, and this allude, uh, he said, that's what I can write realistically about. He said, all this fantasy stuff, all this fantasy fun, and I think you're right that he really enjoyed it, 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 it was rather naughty about uh, 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 his, his portrayal. I mean, he, he let it take off. Uh, it, it, uh, and so th those are my few th uh, thoughts about uh, working with this absolutely exceptional translator. I mean, 
uh, Dennis was the person who taught, uh, said, look, you can't, uh, translation is only half verbal, it's, a lot of it is cultural. And so he and, and, and Ty together worked on, uh, on, on, on what he, what Dennis understood would uh, be the reception of the audience in, in, in London. Anyhow, that's, uh, I've really enjoyed your lecture very much indeed, and uh, it stirred up these thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, his love for Sydney's village was unquestioning. We cannot be quite, but yet there is an ambivalence in this particular novel, which there isn't, I think, in the earlier two. That, that it's, it's not all wonderful. I mean, the way the old villagers clubbed together to force Hosner to marry the lusty and you know, determined and rape Rudd Rice is rather horrible. And the, the grandfather, who's presented as the, the incarnation of traditional old village values and he's very old indeed and very pious his street is like a kind of saint at first and yet slowly this is undermined and uh, the grandfather doesn't give a damn when Husner's body is cast into the river but he attends the funeral of one race there's, there's this sort of expression of doubt in this particular novel I think when he gets back and comes back in Banda Shah to a more traditional way of doing things the ambiguity has been removed but in this particular novel the love is there, the, the seasonal descriptions and everything, and, and there's a great deal of enthusiasm for the old ways of doing things and lament for change, but at the same time, he's uneasily aware that some of, the, some of it should be changed. I wonder if you could comment particularly on the river um, and its uh, place in um, and maybe some other rivers that it might allude to. Oh, not really. I don't think I have much to say there. It's just that the Nile does run north, and as the birds migrate north and Taib Saleh, sorry, Mustafa Said has to migrate north. Uh, and, but yet the village is on a bend, so the river where they are is running east-west, and so if you go into it, you're halfway between north and south. There's, there's that kind of symbolism. Um, the, he, he uses the river a bit to signify change in the village, like how the water wheels our, the traditional water wheels are replaced by village pumps. That's, and that's one of the signs that things are changing. And then when that happens, people who had previously migrated from the village to Khartoum and elsewhere come back to the village because there's more land that um, pos is possible to cultivate. Um, beyond that, well, as I've been suggesting, the river is supposed to send up or echo Conrad's Thames and Conrad's Congo, he wants that kind of... He, he expects many readers to pick up that this is a kind of replay, a, a sort of distorted replay of Heart of Darkness. I don't think I've got anything else to say about this. I suppose it's significant that both Mustafa Said and Mohammed seek their end in the river, but I'd be pushed to say what exactly what that significance is. Robert, can I ask you, it's billed over here. It's billed as the most important Arabic novel of the 20th century. Can you speak a little bit on any views you may have to, in its relevance to the 21st century? Melvin said as we were going on, and we don't do relevance. And I, I thought, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do relevance. And my book on Ibn Khaldun coming out next year doesn't do relevance. I'm blowed if I'm going to present this Ibn Khaldun's text as useful to 20th century politicians and economists and so on. And I feel the same about it. You know, one shouldn't read Sir Gawain in the Green Knight or the Aeneid hunting for relevance, hunting for something that's useful. Um, it, it's the only thing why its value is precisely its retrospection, what it tells you about what it was once like, I think. I am very disinclined to <laughs> go into relevance. Thank you so much for the, for the talk. And uh, I just wanted to go back to the point that you had about the duality that um, Hamad and Mustafa Saeed, um, Saeed sorry, uh, kind of play off one another within the novel. Um, and I wanted you to, to perhaps, if you could, uh, discuss how that plays out in their relationship to Husna and more broadly their relationship to women huh. throughout the story. Mohammed is incredibly repressed. Um, there's this extraordinary scene where all the villagers sit round 
the grandfather, Wad Rais, Bint Mashzub, uh, two or three others, talking about sex with amazing frankness. And Mohammed's there, and they brought him, come on, come on, what's it like in England? How, how, did, how did you get your, your, your kit off there? Um, and he won't bite. He won't reveal anything. He, is, he seems to be without sex. One, one, if there weren't a single ref, I think it's a single reference that he is already married, you wouldn't know he'd had sex at all. You might think he was a virgin. Um, and he seems... To, he clearly fancies Hosna, although it doesn't become apparent until she's dead quite how much he was in love with her, but he is scared to commit to her. Um, so he's failed, um, he's failed Mustafa Said, he's failed Hosna, and he's failed the two sons with whom he's also entrusted. He is a, somebody who cannot commit and who is afraid of sex, it would seem. Um, so he's the opposite of Mustafa Said. Uh, and culpable. Um, it's his irresolution, his failure to propose to Hosna that leads to her death. So in a way, he's almost, just about almost as guilty as Mustafa Said with his murders and his leading women to suicides. Because Hosna commits suicide. What does make one of the most important Arabic novel written in the 20th century? Why? Why it is? Is it because of the narrative skills of Taib Saleh, or was it because of the contrast within the context? I mean, the main character, um, Mustafa Said, who live in two different sets of civilization. So why it is one of the most important Arabic novel written within the 20th century? Right. Um, well, first, uh, I'll point out that the most important Arabic novel of the 20th century, as this is billed, is in quotation marks. It is actually the decision taken by a group of Arab novelists and academics um, at the end of the 20th century, and it's their vote that makes it such. But certainly, yes, I would wish to defend it as the most important Arabic novel of the 20th century. Of course, it has... Uh, contenders, uh, Nagib Mahfouz and Edouard Harat, I would particularly, and Gitani perhaps. Um, but I think what's important about it is the way this particular novel engages with Western culture, some, quite often in a rather hostile way, but engages with Western culture without submitting to Western culture, without um, bowing to its conventions. Whereas... Um, Managi Mahfouz's excellent trilogy, the Cairo trilogy, Palace Walk, um, is a novel all about Egypt over the decades, but it, it follows the conventions, strictly the conventions of the Western novel. It, it's as if, it was, as if sort of Trollope had gone out to 20th century Egypt and then produced this novel. It's, it's a very good novel, but it, it doesn't seem to me quite in the same, same league. Um, this is, a, this is a novel of amazing sophistication. Um, I think it's much more sophisticated than even quite... There are, of course, some very difficult and sophisticated novels, um, some which are more, perhaps more difficult than sophisticated, but um, <laughs> this is the winner, I think. Um, what can I say? It's got so much. As I say, I could have... I've just been talking about narrative play and so on and, and how things happen with it, but I could have talked for an hour about sex here. Or I could have talked about politics, and almost any other academic who'd been invited to talk about this would have gone for the political reading, could have talked for an hour about this. This is such a rich novel. <laughs>